So as you can probably tell from these slides that have been projected while you ate all your pizza with my little cartoon face, um, my name is Sarah Groff Henny Palermo. I exist on Twitter as Super SGP. So if you like or hate the opinions you hear today, if you're really interested in opinions about the MTA or the L train, for instance, I highly suggest following this account. Um, I work mostly as a front-end engineer. Um, I'm starting a new position next Monday, so I'm not going to tell you where because I'm afraid of cursing at all. Um, but that doesn't matter because today I'm here to talk to you about one of my favorite papers, which is Exception Handling, Issues in a Proposed Notation uh, by John B. Goodenough from 1975. I'm going to spare us all the last name jokes he always gets dealing with exceptions. We can all thank them inside and giggle. Um, and so I really love this paper, uh, partly because I think it's a great microcosm for a lot of language design questions and trade-offs, partly because I think actually a bunch of it was never implemented, and I really identify with having ideas that I think are great that nobody will ever do. Um, <laughs> And partly because I just really love errors. I find it delightful, actually, that we've had this whole AV situation before we started. I think it's just, you know, setting the scene. It's beautiful. Um, and so I first came across this paper when I was researching a talk I gave last year on errors in JavaScript. And I started off looking for sort of the historical roots of JavaScript style exceptions. Oh, by the way, this is the cover page of that. The illustration is by Emily Griffin. She's the one who did all the cute illustrations in all of this talk. If you're ever giving a tech talk and you want cute illustrations, she's great. That's just, you know. Anyway, the historical roots of JavaScript style exceptions. And the short answer is that JavaScript picked up its style of exceptions from C++, which brought over basically half of a PL1 style exception, uh, deciding to remove a number of the capabilities because they were found to be, quote, unused in Cedar Mesa. Um, and so it's this gap that I'm really interested in and really excited about, right? Like, what's the unused part? What did we leave out when we changed that? What's been lost? Um, and so for me, what's sort of floating around here in the ether is this broader view of errors and control flow that's embodied in the exceptions approach and um, sort of the suggestions that never even made it that far. There's a sense of a different kind of relationship with machines. And so originally, I got into this topic because computer science has been having its like type moments lately, and I am not a types person. This is a well-known fact about Sarah. Um, and in particular, I have a lot of questions about the possibility and the desirability of even eliminating errors, which is mostly like what people try to answer when you say, why types, right? Like, we're going to fix errors. But that seems silly to me. Um, and then I got super into errors themselves and mostly forgot about the types. Um, I mean, like in talks, I will totally talk to you about types at the bar forever until you're sick of it. But, um, and that's because errors, errors are really great. Um, errors are these like delightfully Janus-faced entities and completely human. Or as Catherine Schultz put it in her book, Being Wrong, which I highly recommend reading on the subway. It makes everyone want to be your friend if you read a book that just is being wrong in giant print. Um, and she says that we want to turn away from error because it reminds us of our existential despair, that we're separate from truth and from one another. But it's also the only true way to engage and create and to imagine is risk error. Everything that makes humans and computers capable of doing great things are the things that make us capable of totally fucking it up. And like, that's great. It's really exciting. Um, but so then what do we do? How do we deal with errors in computing and how does this paper fit in? So to answer that, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about PL1 itself, about the varied approaches to error handling that we've seen in computer science history, about the characteristics and uses of exceptions that Goodenough identifies in his paper, and then I'm going to go into detail um, on the syntax and specific issues that the paper addresses. So PL1. PL1 was developed by IBM. The first compiler appeared in 1966, and the standard was approved a decade later in 1976. This paper was written in 1975 to give you some sort of context. Um, in this languages family tree, right, we can see it way up there, descending from Algol and Fortran and influencing C in that big arc. Um, the bottom is 1975 for context here. <laughs> 
And its primary domains are data processing, numerical computation, scientific computing, and systems programming. Which is to say, it was one of the first languages that really sought to be general purpose, that wasn't about a specific domain. Its goals included being competitive in both performance and syntax with Fortran and COBOL, being machine independent, and having a syntax that was both concise and flexible, which is, you know, really all of our dream. Um, today, many airline and car rental reservation systems are in SaberTalk, which is a variety of PL1. You interact with it usually when you're most angry. <laughs> Its preprocessor and compilers were very innovative. Um, it had first class support for pointers and basic multitasking and three types of memory allocation. Static, automatic, which is to say via the stack, and controlled via the heat. People were very excited about this in 1966. It also added two excellent error handling techniques to what was at the time a pretty sparse landscape, um, entering the debugger and throwing an exception. And I say added here because similar ideas arose in multiple places. There's a very strong argument that Lisp originated exceptions. Um, PL1 was the first really go-to focus language that brought them up, and I feel like saying they added them is like a nice fudge there. <laughs> These days, of course, we have a number of different ways to deal with errors. And um, I'm going to start off talking a little bit, taking us for a brief trip through errors in history. Socrates loved errors. Abe Lincoln loved errors. I don't know who the lady is. Let's say Betsy Ross. Betsy Ross loved errors. <laughs> there are actually supposed to be 14 stripes on the flag. Nobody knew. Um, <laughs> And so if we arrange general error handling methods from the dramatic to the subtle, um, we can start with the most dramatic, just crashing, right? And this is the original classic, direct from Fortran. Um, and it makes sense, right? When a computer is a glorified calculator, why would you keep going if you know there's an error and the calculations are going to be wrong? Um, especially if the most knowledgeable operator is sitting right there in front of the machine. In modern times, though, this can be anywhere from moderately to very inconvenient. For instance, you thought I said I talked about the subway a lot. I'm insufferable. But throughout the last year, there have been bugs at a computerized switch at Bergen Street, which means the MTA has to keep going and rebooting that switch, which takes forever. And it's pretty much behind most of the meltdowns you see when you see that there's a switch problem at the Bergen FG. Because in that solid state switch, they decided just crashing was the best way to deal with that error. Um, so the next and slightly less dramatic option is to enter the debugger, which you might be familiar with if you've written a lot of Rails. It also happens in other languages. That's where I'm most familiar with it. Um, things break. You can access the REPL, check out what's going on. The switch engineers might have even been happier for that option, right? Even less dramatic, but just as old school, is returning a special value. And this approach is pretty deprecated in modern languages. Um, except in utility functions that are based on older standard libraries, and of course, Go. Um, <laughs> it saves programs from the totally destructive interruptions of crashing, but it does, you know, mostly break things and suffer from the semi-predicate problem, which is to say that you have to check for it explicitly. On the other hand, this is where we start to admit that, there, that some form of recovery is possible a little ray of hope. Um, and rather, its predecessor was when people first started admitting that, which is to say setting an error flag, um, which is one of the first solutions to be implemented after just crashing. And here's an example of that in basic, right, where we're calling a function, and then we're seeing if there's an error code, and if it's you know not zero, then we deal with it, and we keep calling another function going through. Um, and you can sort of, it doesn't take a lot of imagination, right, to look at this approach and see how it might start turning into returning the error code directly, right, rather than setting some flags somewhere. Um, and I think that there's an interesting tension between the kinds of recovery each of these approaches supposes. Um, right, this example presumes that recovery is the same regardless of where the error code emerges, that like all sort of errors should be dealt with the same, versus returning the code closes over the recovery, allowing for sort of a more specific recovery. And then the third and most recent variation on this sort of error communication is to send a signal using the DOMS on error event emitter or say Erlang's exit signals. And I list this as being less dramatic than setting an error flag, but more dramatic than returning a special error value, because it's harder to ignore than the value just being set somewhere over there, um, but easier to ignore than it being dumped in your lap on return where you're looking for your data. Um, but it does maintain the possibility for specific responses, which I really like about it. 
Finally, there's the least dramatic option to recover and keep going. And sometimes this seems ridiculous to people, right? Like, why hide errors? You're going to hide them, and bad things will happen, and it'll be so terrible to debug, and don't do that, everyone says. Um, but context and the possibilities for recovery really matter. Um, when HTML still renders a mostly broken page by guessing where to stick your closing paragraph tag, it's probably fine. <laughs> Um, and there are some cases, some scientific cases, where it's the most practical. So I learned when doing all of this research um, that the default IEEE 754 floating point exception handling behavior is to resume computation following the substitute of a default value if there's an arithmetic error. And this would have prevented uh, the Ariane 5 explosion, which was in part caused by the fact that Ada just aborts computation on arithmetic error and then, you know, blew up a whole rocket. Like, sometimes recovery is actually a great plan. Um, and there's a number of forms that that recovery can take, right? You can revert to a default, or you can guess the way HTML does. Um, you can use optional or maybe types, which is a way of enforcing dealing with recovery in some parameter. If you're asking for a nullable thing, you better have a plan if it doesn't come through. Um, or you could do something like algebraic effects, which I would say is a broader application of that monadic approach, which has shown up lately in research languages like F, right, where we're wrapping functions with handlers that can take care of state and exceptions and other impure results. Um, the really important part of this code is the fact that the effect takes an argument K, which is essentially the continuation. Um, it is the state where the function has been called, and you can sort of grab it after you've done whatever things you need to do. And so that leaves us in our list of ways to deal with errors with throwing an exception, the topic of tonight's paper. Um, and it enters just this side of the recovery as possible line, as depending on how it's implemented, it can provide for recovery, but it demands attention either way. Or, as good enough put it, of the conditions detected while attempting to perform some operation, exception conditions are inherently those that are brought to the attention of the operations invoker and that the invoker is either permitted or required to respond to. Um, from this, he expands into the salient characteristics of exceptions themselves. Um, I think this is the most important one. Their full significance can only be known outside the operation where the problem is detected. If a function can't read a file, the meaning of being incapable of reading that file is only really comprehensible outside the scope of the function whose goal is to read the file. Um, given this division of knowledge, both the invoker of the operation or the operation itself may need to require termination. And finally, the invoker should be able to determine whether the default response is triggered or overridden, which of course implies that default responses exist. And these responses, of course, as we just talked about, don't have to be to crash, right? We're looking to lessen the burden on programmers by not requiring handlers to be defined up and down the call stack, but only on divergence or when it's really important. And something cool about this definition means that exceptions aren't just for errors. Nothing in that talk said that like, exceptions are when things go wrong. They're just when you want some attention from the operator, um, which is a sort of woven communication between the operator and the machine. So they can be used to deal with failure, as we've discussed, but also to add information about a result or to facilitate monitoring. And it's from these three capabilities that good enough derives the needs of exceptions. So let's talk a little bit about them some more, dealing with failure. Failures can be divided into two parts, domain and range. Domain failures are the sort of failures we tend to focus on, um, the kind that we think we can control, I think, so that's why we like to focus on them. Um, it's where there's a flaw in the function's input. Um, you got a string where you expected a number, a field was missing, um, et cetera. And to deal with this sort of failure, the invoker must be provided with enough information to fix and resubmit the input if they would like to. Um, if this is not possible, the invoker must be able to cancel the operation, and if so, right, there should be space left for optional cleanup. And together, this basically adds up to access to both the operands that are involved in the function and internal information about the invocation itself. Then we have range failures. Range failures, unsurprisingly, are the other end, where the operation is unable to somehow fulfill its success criteria. Um, whether a numerical operation returns divergent values or a read function encounters an end of, life, an end of file character instead of another line of data, um, we tend to run into them less in modern languages, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, to address range failures, the invoker needs to be able to terminate the operation and do any cleanup, 
Um, the invoker should also be able to retry the operation. Good enough sites a tape reading error is a case where this would be useful, but let's say we have a Heisen bug or there's like a network request. Like there's a number of cases where retrying might make you successful. Finally, operations should be able to terminate and return a partial result to the invoker. And I love like the idea included in this requirement, right? That partial results might be sufficient depending on what you're doing. You might not need a machine to know everything and give you everything perfectly. Um, good enough uses this as an example, a defective tape that could be verified or fixed up. Um, but I start to think about things like, let's say there's an OCR machine that can tell the operator it's unsure, that can return you things. Or it's also used in the 2004 MapReduce paper, right? Uh, records that consistently fail are eventually just skipped. They're not important to the work done on other records. You don't need to stop processing millions of things because one thing is broken. You can just skip it. Um, and I've always wanted in JavaScript, like this concept of loose map, right, where the failing operations could be discarded. If you're using JavaScript a lot of times, right, like you're operating over user input. Sometimes people put weird stuff in there. Um, the ability to sort of just filter that out or even put it in a data structure that tells you it's broken without blowing up your whole operation could be really useful. Altogether, though, in both types of failures, we're looking at requirements for optional termination and unwinding actions that have been taken, the ability to deal with partial results, and the inclusion of useful contextual information. Um, all these sound really cool. And the last one brings us to the second use for exceptions, which is to say classifying results. Um, if an operation is successful, you might still want the information that you would want on a partial failure. Um, you might want to classify your results. You might want to know, you know, how the information was provided. Did you give a range of computations and one of them worked? Um, were there other successful matches? Is it a default, right? There's a whole bunch of information you might want to know and good enough suggests exceptions might be useful for this. If we blow this up even bigger, it can be expanded into the third use for exceptions, which is to monitor operations. Um, in this case, an exception could be triggered on every call or every tenth call or whatever rhythmic variation of a function that you want. Um, most importantly called without unwinding the call stack or otherwise sort of interfering with the work that the machine is doing, right? Especially it's 1975. Computers only have so much power. Being able to get some value inside a whole bunch of work is really useful. And today, we might think of this, um, if we think about JavaScript, as passing a callback to a search algorithm that you're calling on every node. Um, but for good enough, instead of having a callback or something else, this is just another use case for the mighty exception. Um, and this requires that the invoker be able, in some cases, to decide whether to terminate or continue, but also includes the possibility that the invoker might be, in fact, required to resume, that the operation can override its invoker in order to enforce the economy of keeping things in media res. And so, altogether, we get an idea of an exception that's not necessarily concerned with error, but facilitates a multi-level interaction with our programs. We want to be able to provide information so fixes can be undertaken, to allow termination, to require termination, to require resumption, to provide access to the operands and contextual information, to allow for retry, and to allow for partial results. Um, and from here, the rest of the paper is sort of devoted to how we get these things um, arranged in these four topics. So the association of handlers with invocations, control flow issues, default exception handling, and hierarchies of operations and their exceptions. The version of exception handling that existed in PL1 when Goodenough began this paper, the version he's sort of responding to here, is centered around on conditions. Um, and the on condition here, the way it works, right, is that it's raised on a specific case on the end file and you can go to something else. You go to the process. Um, the system was incredibly resource intensive and could therefore be disabled, so you could deal with errors, but you could also literally just be like, I don't care, keep going. Light on fire and blow up, it's fine. Um, because it was so resource intensive. Um, later on statements could override previous statements and different categories sort of required or forbade continuation, but you just had to know which one was which. <laughs> 
Um, and Goodenough's goal was to propose a new notation that would keep the flexibility of that setup as much as possible while also helping programmers to avoid the three major problems of forgetting that an operation can raise a particular type of exception, associating the handler with the wrong activation point, or associating the handler with the wrong exception. And he proposed to do so through requiring explicit declaration of the exceptions that a function can raise and through static binding of an activation of um, a static binding of a handler to an activation point, so less the on condition and more sticking it on there. Um, and this he covers in the first section. So let's look at how this works. When we talk about associating handlers with invocations, we're looking at three separate locations in code. An operation, which is to say a call to a user-defined or system function, its invocation, the attempt to execute it, um, and the activation point, the situation in which everything is uh, going down. So in this example, F and multiplication are both operations. F is invoked n times. Multiplication is invoked two n times. There's one activation point for F and two for multiply. And so a handler is attached to a procedure call um, to an activation point by following that within brackets. And this is our static association. So here, handler.action is called when exception x is thrown in the context of G, called with argument A at this particular activation point here in space because we don't have any other code. It can be attached to operations like addition to the inbuilt ones by enclosing the operation itself in parens and then defining the handler for the exception. In this case, an overflow that results from addition. Multiple handlers are possible, um, right? In this case, there's an overflow, so we presume that F is doing some addition somewhere. Um, we've got our zero divide, we've got our X handler, all sort of stuck on the end of our function call. Can also be attached to statements and to loops. So right, you're calling a read operation, you have the end file handler there at the end of the loop. Each handler applies to all activations within that handler's reach. So this first case shows us what sort of different overflow handlers for multiplication and addition. Excuse me. Versus in the second case, overflow is being used for multiplication and addition and is being dealt with in the same way, wrapped in those little parens. And this does raise the possibility of an ambiguity. In the first case, there's no handler for um, the, the X exception when it's raised by F of A up there in the assignment to H um, because it's not wrapped in parens the way the assignment to I is. And so um, the handler that applies to it in this case is the one after the end. Does the programmer intend for that to happen? There's not really any way to know. Um, and for good enough, the trade-off of this miss is sort of worth the effort saved by not requiring per activation handling, which I'm sure we can all imagine would be a lot. Um, so there is a little bit of ambiguity he's allowing through. And overall, this approach allows for exceptions to be dealt with generally, as uniformly or as granularly as the user prefers. The notation also allows, good enough says, for programmers to indicate which implementation of exceptions they prefer in the compiler. Um, it's implementation neutral. He admits, of course, that no systems that could actually take advantage of this neutrality exist at the time the paper was written, but he's not gonna foreclose the possibility, and I find that like really delightful. <laughs> um, and it's such an interesting like clash, right? There's like this devotion to flexible implementation on the one hand, and the removal of flexibility by requiring static association on the other hand. Um, he forecloses dynamism on a language level while preserving it on an implementation level. To me, this points towards sort of an assumption of expertise in the programmer operators. That's not necessarily the case today. I don't think most people have deep feelings about how their compiler is implementing, say, garbage collection, unless you have a really specific problem. But mostly people are like, sure. <laughs> but he thinks maybe you want to decide, and that's great. Um, but he is really comfortable with coupling, right? Um, with preventing any later and looser association of event handling. Um, although this does generalize some couplings, so in the earlier version of PL1, only one on condition could deal with any like named exception. It would just keep bubbling up. So at least in this case, this sort of static application means like he's like, you don't have to have 50 different names to deal with a, an exception at every level. You can just like take one name and deal with all of them. Um, but it is a little less flexible. And it's an interesting trade-off that maybe you wouldn't think about when you're writing your own languages, which I'm sure all of you are. Okay, two of you are, I know for sure but all of you are. <laughs> all right, so section two, control flow issues. 
Um, so how do you leave a handler and how do you return? These questions are at the crux of integrating exceptions into any system. Exceptions interfere with control flow. We should have a plan for how that's going to work. Um, Good enough suggests that we should, we should continue to make it difficult for programmers to err by looking for explicit declarations of the type of exception. And that's uh, escape notifier signal. And it has to do with how we deal with these exceptions. He wants to support good developer experience. In his case, that means go to free programming uh, by allowing multi-level exits. And um, he wants to add operators to support dealing with an exception both locally and globally, cleaning up after the action is taken, and handling um, on operation completion. So and I'm going to look at these a little bit more detail. Escape type exceptions require termination, and they support the go-to free programming by exiting multiple levels at once. They work a lot like return does, probably in languages you're familiar with. Signal type exceptions allow either termination or resumption at operator discretion. They're sort of just like, yeah, do whatever you want, man. They're the cool dad. Um, and notify requires resumption. Multiple types of exception can be returned by a procedure, right? F can give us an X, which is an escape type, and Y, which is a signal type. Exceptions can also be raised within handlers in a magical Ouroboros. Uh, here, F is able to raise X, which is handled by G. G can raise Y. If Y fails, everything is going to be exited with exception Z. Um, and in this case, an enclosing function would have to deal with exception Z, or it would be a compiler error. Escape can exit several levels at once. It would go all the way out to this second end. Um, and it can be treated locally and then forwarded to the wider context. Good enough here takes a moment to sort of suggest that explicit forwarding of X bit by bit over implicit forwarding by refusing to deal with it might be good for clarity and readability for other programmers. Um, then we have our first support command, and that's exit. And the option to exit the handler, uh, exit lets you exit the handler, but not the subroutine, not like return, not like escape. It's just exiting um, a single handler. And you can call it, and it only can go with signal commands, um, because you have to leave notify, and you cannot, I mean, you have to leave escape, you cannot leave notify, so exit only matters in signals where at some point you can leave this. Um, and you can use it with a value or without a value, which means you can do some really entertaining things, right? So in example one, if A plus B is greater than C, if A plus B is an overflow, then it's inherently greater than C, right? So you can be like, instead of telling me it's an overflow, just return true, and I'm gonna keep going. <laughs> um, you can also use exit with a value to create either a default value or even bring back sort of that signal flag, right? If there's an overflow here assigning to D, D is just going to get the value of negative 1 if you exit with negative 1. Um, and then in the third example, calling exit just plain exits the whole block. So if when you call Q, it throws A, we're just going to skip all the way to calling F. We're not going to do, we're not going to evaluate either part of this conditional. Um, good enough also thought a little bit about adding even more flexibility, allowing for an exit command that returned the name of the exited function. But since you already have to like deal with everything at every level anyway, he was like, eh. Maybe that's too much. And of course, you could just return it as a value. So he did restrain himself there for a moment. But we started to see how we can sort of encompass all of these other error handling things that once happened in our great big exception system. Next, we move on to resume, um, which indicates that a signal or notify exception can pass control right back to the invoker. So here, right, we have this signal value that's actually invoked for each loop if I jump back there, right? So from 1 to 100, every time you go through, you're going to signal the value. Um, and by doing that, it allows resume to be used in an invoking function to do something even like this basic sort of reduce, where every time it's called, the value is sent back, the value adds it to a sum, and then it keeps going around and getting re-invoked uh, without unwinding the stack or doing extra work or doing anything else. You sort of can sit outside and make use of this value that the function is sending to you. 
Um, but let's say that instead of going all the way through, we wanted to exit the procedure once we find what we're looking for. Or let's say we want to insert x when it's not found. Using exit and resume, it could be written this way, uh, right? Which is sort of a complex way to short circuit and avoid the call to insert, and you jump all over and control flow. Basically, what happens is we call scan, and if we remember from two slides in like 50 seconds ago, scan is going to signal the value. So scan does that, and we go into our value handler, and we say, oh, does v equals x? If it doesn't, we resume and go back to scan, which then sends the value out for another iteration. If it works out, we could potentially choose to exit, which means that that call to insert isn't going to happen because we're exiting the Eventually, we keep resuming until scan is reached, which means what we're looking for isn't there at all. And then we trigger insert. Um, it's very clever. It's not very easy to read. And if somebody did that in code at work, you would be like, oh my god, Bob, stop. Uh, <laughs> So, good enough, trying to be friendly is like, ah, oh, I'm going to add ended. And this will uh, help avoid this torturous control flow and the trap of implicit skipping of the insert operation by just saying, call scan, if things work out, exit, otherwise resume, and then if ended happens when you didn't exit, do this friend. Um, and I find this code really interesting, right? This sort of short call, and then there's some named branches after it telling you what to do with the value that's going on inside the function. Um, and I started to wonder about how I would write it in languages I like, or even worse, or better, this way more complex example, right? Where in this case, it's using escape on found to operate and say, go, OK, I'm going to set this. If found never happens, it's using ended. This is an example about finding things in an array and either and tracking how often you look for it and setting you to which point in the array it exists. Um, but if you consider for a moment how you would write this in, your, in the language you use every day, would you be like really like imperative and just use a for loop and a whole bunch of you know variables in the enclosing scope to do it? Would you want to do something like use find and a ternary and get really clever about how you're assigning things? Um, I think it's a really interesting question because it's so familiar and yet so strange. And I wonder, you know, is this a case of straining a system to enable functionality that we just take for granted? Like, I would write this differently. It was 1975. He's like pointing towards something bigger. Um, is it actually clearer? Would you sort of enjoy being like, if this is what happened in my functions, please call this this way? Um, I'm not totally sure, but it's something I really love about this paper that it's like a tiny piece and a really long conversation. Um, and the questions I take for it could take you, you know, deeper into the history of PL1. You could start looking more into signal-based programming. Uh, we could talk about the consistent needs we have from all programming languages as sort of a baseline, just from this like very uncanny example. Um, but to return to the microcosm itself, I've got one more support command, and that is cleanup. The cleanup command can only be attached to a signal exception, and it can only be invoked implicitly, um, which you want to remember for one second. Cleanup handlers are invoked from the inside out. So in this case, we see that H is a subroutine that might raise a signal exception. If it does so at this activation point, the handler will also raise a signal. And this signal will forward to this last one. <coughs> Each of these have cleanups attached to them, and the cleanup actions will be triggered from the least to most recent called or inside to outside, so that the unshown cleanup within H will run, then pass control to the handler attached to the second, and then to the one attached to G. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and this makes sense, right? Each procedure cleans up whatever it needs to within its remit, then passes along control to the next cleanup handler. But what happens when the Z escape exception is triggered? The cleanup attached to G is then never going to run. It's just going to escape. Uh, because cleanup can ever, only ever be associated with a signal. Likewise, a cleanup action is restricted in what it may contain. It can't raise exceptions that would cause a short circuit, um, because this would also short circuit the cleanup chain. And altogether, I would say this is a little bit of a mess. 
There are so many restrictions on cleanup and ways that you could accidentally mess up without sort of taking care of these like dangling threads. Um, and so I can see how try, catch, and finally would seem like this really clear, great solution once you're like, just do this. <coughs> I'm so sorry. Um, but I think this mess is also great. Uh, because it shows us the full complexity of the requirements of sort of this kind of relationship that we're talking about, this like woven communication. Um, and it gives us a context to evaluate later approaches to flexible exceptions within. For me, it really points to like the value of event-driven programming, even if it undermines the guarantees of static typing and safety, right? But of course, I would say that. Other people might pick a different sort of version. Um, but so far, these are all topics related to user-defined exceptions. But there's another part to all of this, which are default exceptions. And default exceptions are implicit exceptions that are executed unless overridden by more explicit handlers. So, um, you know, originally these were handled with on conditions by using the system keyword. Um, that's how you get the default. You're like, on this condition, do whatever the system says. Um, but you couldn't put user-defined versions in here, so it's basically like the default is an event system without an emitter. You just get what you have. Uh, instead, good enough proposed his notation to support the declaration of default exceptions, programmer defined default handlers, uniform handling um, for both kinds, user defined and system defaults, and the explicit invocation or overriding of defaults, and the ability for this to be determined by the higher level invokers. You know, he just has to solve all of these things with one little piece of syntax. Um, and in his case, he decides to solve that with this one little piece of syntax, the optional keyword. Um, optional indicates a handler is required for X, but not for Z. Escape says good enough, cannot by their nature have a default handler. And I assume that this is because by definition they have to exit, but I would imagine you might want some default handler to an escape that does something and then exits, but you would have to catch it and do that thing. Um, the program also will not search for defaults across submodule boundaries, but luckily they can be explicitly invoked. Totally forgetting about cleanup, which he thought up like 10 seconds ago, good enough says it's always dangerous to provide only implicit ways of invoking some capability. So in terms of defaults, this is accomplished by adding the default parameter to the resume command. You can resume default. Um, and this is sort of the equivalent of an escape. Uh, it's like, yeah, go ahead, do whatever the default is. But it passes control back down into the um, inside function as opposed to up into the enclosing scope, which is what escape would do. Altogether then, a signal exception could sort of have this whole huge signature, right? It could have a default, and then it could use ended, which is invoked if default is overridden. So if you're really determined something happened inside your procedure, you can be like, no, this all the time. Um, and you can clean up, you know, just for fun. And then these can all be combined within a single procedure to allow for different handling at different activation sites, right? And I sort of love this. Um, you can override the default handler and then just terminate the call to a procedure. Although, as we've just discussed, the default handler could have ended in there to like get you back. Uh, you can just call the default handler implicitly or handier. I was doing good typing then. Um, you can invoke the default handler explicitly. You can override it and not perform assignment in this case. You can overflow, and if there's some default assignment, that's what's going to be assigned to A. And likewise, you can do it explicitly. Um, at each different activation site, you can choose a different way to deal with default. And this becomes really interesting when you start looking at packages. Um, you can sort of allow each package to deal with its own default handling or to override this passing flow up and down. Um, there's a whole more detailed explanation of this in the paper that you can read. The thing about it that I think is really interesting is sort of how exception forward this code continues to be. The call to print is like all the way over here at the left. It's like the tiniest piece of the whole code. Um, and that might be because these are examples in an exception paper, so they're kind of exception forward. But it also gets me thinking about what code um, that was focused on effects over accomplishment might look like, which I think is maybe what I was thinking about before, right? We write code where we're so focused on accomplish this, accomplish this, accomplish this. What would it be like if we're like, hey, try to do this thing, and then this is what might happen, and this is how we should deal with all of these things. Um, I wonder about that. Uh, and 
Altogether, though, he's looking to encompass default and override handlers and allow higher level or lower level functions to win. And how does that work out across the system? Well, the last section talks about hierarchies of operations and their exceptions. Good enough points out that the notation so far can lead to cumbersome code where some functions or subroutines basically just have to pass along exceptions from functions they themselves invoke. Here B serves to only pass on exceptions from C to A when it's invoked by A. B has nothing to do with what's going on. It's just like, hey, stuff might be broken. You might want to fix it. Um, and so good enough decides to add in the pass keyword, uh, which when used with other PL1 syntax can look really clear like this. In the case of X, Y, and Z, you might take you might take some sort of action, call pass, do whatever cleanup you need to do, and send it back up into the caller. Um, and this provides the ability to treat groups um, identically, to lay different pieces out. Um, and then, but unfortunately, when new exceptions are added, you still have to go back in and at least put pass on every piece of that code. And good enough once more argues that this is probably worthwhile because the biggest drawback, the difficulty of triggering top level reactions, can sort of be mitigated with an explicit top level command. Every problem he finds, it's like, oh, we'll just write a new command and then everything will be fine. Uh, it can expand into bigger commands. It's kind of like macros. Um, and sort of, this is where the paper ends, right? Uh, with an incomplete notation, good enough at, at notes, right? He hasn't dealt with passing parameters, uh, but with a problem and a series of solutions to that problem. A very solid notation, and of the most interest to me, a set of interesting trade offs between, you know, the event driven and the static analysis, between per activation calls and an ambiguous reach, between hierarchical compl complexity and flexible control flow, verbosity and granularity, convenience and explicitness. Um, and these are questions we like find ourselves asking today around explicitness and analysis and burdens. Um, the whole system also sort of tiptoes around that quagmire where a desire for flexibility and specificity within a system system can lead to like so many rules and requirements that you find yourself like entirely bound up within that hydra again um, when you're trying to make everything easy and fun. Um, <laughs> the trade-off between explicitness and convenience, particularly in terms of dealing with exceptions, right, um, is a big problem that happened in say Java around checked exceptions. Some people really hate it. They just put throw on everything because they're like, oh my god, why do I have to tell you all of this information? But it was for a good use, right? You want to know what exceptions something's going to call so that you can deal with them. Um, and we can find other bits of these requirements and approaches with way more sort of felicitous uh, implementations out in the world. For instance, with this conditionals, which predate uh, this paper, um, right, there's like another way that's very similar. We have named exceptions and ways to deal with them to pass along default arguments, etc. There's a very good talk by Chris Hauser that if you're at all interested in this, I recommend watching. Um, and we find it also in things like acceptance testing, right? So in this pattern, an acceptance test is defined, preferred and alternate methods of generating a successful result are provided, and at the end, if none of them work, then you can throw an error. Implicit cleanup happens between each try, and since ensure can refer to variables both before and after alternates are run, it can work for pre and post conditions or domain and range errors. This is another sort of inversion of the kind of work that Goodenough was doing with his exceptions. And then, of course, there's these friendly effects handlers, which I talked about earlier, which provide resumption capabilities. Um, themselves, I think, the least replicated aspects of good enough's work, and to me, the most interesting, maybe just because I haven't seen how they can all go wrong yet, because we haven't tried. So like, maybe we should try. That's what I think. Um, <laughs> you know, I would love to see what would be possible if we had solid defaults, maybe in arguments instead of in the handlers themselves, uh, combined with event-based handlers, right? We could avoid the downsides of try blocks and make it easier to add reactions when new functions come online, um, but sort of keep them encapsulated. And like this ability to intervene and resume because the reason I think I love errors is because 
in these approaches is the lack of absolutism, the lack of a sense that computing is supposed to be perfect and have every answer, which I think we hear more and more every day. But instead, we just get this sense that we can work like with the machines. Um, because it's in the interface between the machine and the human where the potential for disaster arises, but also the potential for discovery and innovation and all of those good things, which I've said like six times now. So I'm going to shut up. But thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. We got time for, I think, three questions. So who's got questions? Or there are no questions. Who's that? Oh, uh, yeah, speaker, uh, something. Hey. Okay. Um, first of all, thanks for what could have been an explanation of why Go chose not to support any of this. <laughs> um, but my question for you is, did you find out about this guy, John B. Goodenough, and is that his real name? <laughs> it is his good name. He taught at CMU. Um, you can definitely go poke around on old websites. I think he is now retired. I haven't seen <coughs> papers lately, but it's definitely his real name. Any other questions? It was, it was very complete, I guess. People, people, people got it. Yeah. <laughs> So some of the stuff with um, where the exception handlers would jump around in like scope and on the stack, that looked a lot like callbacks to me. It's the kind of stuff you'd like just pass a first class function into another function. And I wonder if there was, if you got anything from the paper that was gesturing towards like first class functions or was that just like not on his mind? No, I don't think it was on his mind at all. I didn't see that. But one of the things I do think that's interesting about a lot of this jumping is uh, what's sort of available within the scope, right? One of the problems with a callback, or often one of the problems with a callback is that you have limited access to the context or the information in the invocation. But in this case, all of those handlers basically have access to everything, which is a much, I think, an artifact of PL1 is an intentional approach. But I think it's an interesting difference. Last one. So one of the things that comes later is the ability to filter what you catch, like in uh, C sharp, I mean, in C plus plus with the, the type of catch and things like that. And you can say, I know what I have to do in this case, and I'm only going to pick that out. Um, so it's interesting that that comes later, and it really comes more to what I think about in terms of error handling. Like, I know what to do with this error. doesn't mean I know what to do with all errors. And unfortunately, what happens with some of this is he says, you're going to deal with everything that happens, deal with it. And I think that's it, it's overwhelming. Yeah, I wonder to some extent, too, when I think about it, how much of it is an artifact of the kinds of programs that they're writing at the time, right? If you have much smaller programs that are doing much less. Like there's like if you're gonna have twenty errors, the sense that you should deal with all twenty of those errors is maybe feels more reasonable than being like, here's a React app, have fun. <laughs> Catch all the errors. All right, we'll sneak one more in because that wasn't really a question. <laughs> Do you think the types of errors they saw in the 1960s and 1970s are different from the types that you see now if you're a front end developer? In some ways, yes. I think there's a I think there's a whole category of errors that as a front end developer you don't have to deal with as much, right? Like an overflow error. I mean, there is a max integer size that JavaScript can deal with, and if you try, I've actually been working on some of the uh, documentation about big int. So like, there's definitely a place where you run out of those errors, but I think that they were dealing with a lot smaller errors on the one hand, and then on the other hand, I think we do deal with a lot more human-driven errors. Um, user input, especially on the front end, I think is probably where 99% of your errors are going to come from, that people are going to be perverse and do things you didn't expect, even if you expected everything. Um, and that was less of a problem, I think, when you had more control over the operators and the input you'd be looking for. All right. I think we'll call it there. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Thank you, everyone.